Okay, we're going to look at theme 2b in the Christianity section of the A-level, and this theme looks at the Trinity, the Christian concept of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, and how they relate to each other, and some modern ideas about the Trinity. So, it would be true to say that all the major branches of Christian Christianity believe in this concept of the Trinity. And this, the, this is the idea that there's only one God, but that God exists also in three persons. And that belief is stated in, um, in the various statements of belief called creeds by the Christian church. So the Eastern Roman Catholic and Protestant all agree on many details of how the belief in the Trinity should be expressed. And as I said, you can see from these um, statements from the various different creeds, the Nicene Creed of 325 CE, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And there we talk about in the Chalcedonian Creed, uh, we acknowledge uh, one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man. And so it goes on. So you can look at those creeds at your leisure. Creed, a statement of belief from the Latin credo, which just means belief. So Trinity is a fundamental doctrine of Christianity. And it's fundamental because it states what Christians believe God is like and who he is also plays a central part in worship. It emphasises that God's very different from human beings. It reflects the way that Christians believe they can encounter God. It's a central element of who Christians are, their identity. It teaches Christians vital truths about relationship and community. And it also reveals that God can be seen only as a spiritual experience whose mystery inspires awe and can't be understood. So if we try and unpack this doctrine, this teaching in a little more detail. So the idea that you've got one God whose Father, Son and Holy Spirit means that there's exactly one God. The Father's God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. The Father's not the Son, the Son's not the Holy Spirit and the Father's not the Holy Spirit. An alternative way of explaining this would be to say there's exactly one God. There are re three really distinct persons, which is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and each of the persons is God. Now, there are common mistakes made by various people concerning the Trinity. And this diagram up here nicely puts together or identifies some of the mistakes or not some of the mistakes but explains some of the common misconceptions so the trinity is not three individuals who together make one god that is not true it's not three jo gods joined together and it's also not three properties of god and when we look at this belief in the trinity we obviously would look at what passages in the Bible link towards this. So Christianity adopted this somewhat complicated idea of God because it's the only way they could make sense of one God in the context of the events that they did witness with Jesus and the teaching of the Bible. So Keith Ward in Religion and Creation in 1996 wrote, the idea of the Trinity does not supersede monotheism, monotheism, a belief in only one God. It interprets it in the light of a specific set of revelatory events and experiences. So humanity encountered God in three different forms. They encountered him in God the Father, revealed by the Old Testament, the Creator, the Lord, the Father, the Judge. They also encountered God as the son in Jesus who lived on earth amongst human beings, the imminent incarnate version of God. And they encountered God as the Holy Spirit. After Jesus had ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes down on the disciples at Pentecost and fills them with new life and power. 
and Christians believe that you can access that Holy Spirit still today. So what did the Bible say? Well, the Bible taught that Christians were to worship Father, Son and Holy Spirit. It also taught that Christians should only worship God. And it also taught that there was only one God. So we must worship only God. We must worship God the Father. We must worship God the Son. We must worship God the Holy Spirit. There's only one God. And this led to, over the ages, <laughs> significant <coughs> excuse me, confusion. So how to unpack this, how to make sense of this all? So, as I stated a couple of minutes ago, it puts Christians in a seemingly impossible position. And the doctrine of the Trinity solves this puzzle by stating that God must be simultaneously both three and one at the same time, three and one. And this is where we have a distinction of the different types of Trinity. So when we talk about an imminent Trinity, that signifies what God is. So three persons, one God. When we talk about an economic Trinity, we are talking about what God actually does in those three forms. So the Father creates, the Son redeems, saves, the Holy Spirit sustains. So those three triangles sort of explain it. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. So let's look at some uh, references to the Trinity in Scripture. Now, obviously, in the Old Testament, the Trinity is not referred to because it's the uh, Jewish holy book and the concept of the Trinity hadn't really come about until Jesus was incarnate on earth. However, Many writers think the Old Testament drops heavy hints about this triune forms of God. For example, um, the Hebrew noun referred to, uh, when used to refer to God in the Old Testament is pluralized. So it implies more than one. If we take the New Testament, there's never an explicit referral to the Trinity as such, but it does contain references to the economic trinity what the trinity does so if you look at matthew's gospel this is jesus speaking therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father of the son of the holy spirit if we look at paul in 2 corinthians he says may the grace of the lord jesus christ the love of god the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all the economic actions of those three parts grace love fellowship and in one john so the apostle john if you believe that was the person that wrote this epistle for there are three that testify the spirit the water and the blood and the three are in agreement so that idea that the three are one now that's an interesting verse and some people suggest that that text was added later to justify the doctrine of the Trinity. Make of it what you will. So let's look at this mystery of the Trinity. At first look, one plus one plus one equals one would appear to be nonsense. The idea that three persons add up to one individual, it doesn't make sense. And logically, it is nonsense. So in reality, Christians don't try to understand the doctrine of the Trinity logically or as a problem of arithmetic. They don't. It's this concept that God is at an epistemic distance, a distance beyond knowledge. Don't try to understand it, accept it. But nevertheless, despite this, there have been attempts to explain the Trinity. Unfortunately, quite often these attempts don't really capture the concept either or are very difficult to understand. So one way out of this problem is to say, as I said a little earlier, that God is not like human beings and human beings get in a mess when they try to describe God using the same sort of language and understanding that we use to describe other human beings. You are limited by the language that you're using. 
language cannot describe the indescribable, something that is transcendent, something that is at an epistemic distance. So human beings don't have any other language available. So basically they have to do the best they can with it. That's fine. As long as you remember the whole truth of the nature of God is simply beyond humanity. So in reality, the doctrine of the Trinity only attempts to provide a very basic rudimentary sketch of the mystery of God's nature, rather than a full description of what God's like. God remains a mystery before which humanity stand in awe. So let's look at some early Christian views. Tertullian, early, uh, early Jewish writer, uh, was the man who first coined the phrase Trinity. But before we even get to him, it would be true to say that the early Christians needed to balance their Jewish monotheism. Remember, all the early Christians, Peter, Jesus, Paul, etc., started off as Jews. So they were monotheistic, belief in one God. The first of the Ten Commandments is you shall have no other gods before me. You can't get more monotheistic than Judaism. So they were trying to balance this Jewish monotheism with a sense of there was more to God than met the eye. Interestingly, the Romans actually viewed early Christians, as they did the Jews, as atheists, whereas Jews saw Christians as polytheists, uh, believing in more than one God. So they were confused about this concept of Trinity. So as I said, Tertullian was the first um, person to coin the word Trinity in the third century. And the doctrine was actually formalized in the Nicene Creed, which we looked at in the very first slide in 325 CE. And that creed stated that the son that was of one substance with the father. Now, the Greek for that is homo usios. So homo, the same, usios, substance. Now, my advice to you students would be to learn that phrase usia or usios because it's going to come in very handy when you are describing the concept of the Trinity. So basically, why did Tertullian come up with this name Trinity? Well, there were heresies knocking around at the time. We know that there were lots of uh, Gospels that were being written that didn't make it into the Bible. There were lots of new ideas about who Jesus was, what the new religion should be. And the church were fighting these, what they considered to be false ideas, these heresies. And the idea of the Trinity was formalized in the Nicene Creed to combat these heresies. And you need to be aware of this. So the theologian Stephen Bullivant summarizes Christian convictions about the nature of God to three basic statements. He says, there's only one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is each God, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not the same. Basic statement about the concept of the Trinity. And Bullivant thinks that each of the heresies during Tertullian's time were denying one of these truths. So some heresies were denying the fact there was only one God, saying there was more than one. Some were saying that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were not each God. One was subordinate to the other. And then the third one was the idea that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were not the same. They were of a different sort of substance. So remember that one, two, three. And if we, if we are counteracting one to say there are three gods, that heresy is called tritheism. If you say the Son is not truly equal to God, but subordinate, somewhat a sort of demigod, that is Arianism and breaking number two. If you believe the Son isn't truly divine, it is truly divine, but not really human, so there's not a human side to the Son, that is Sabellianism. Both of these, Arianism and Sabellianism, are um, denying something with number two in that statement. Uh, to say the son wasn't pre-existing but became God's son at baptism is the heresy of adoptionism. Again, picking at number two there. And finally, to say the persons are not, re are not really different from each other, uh, same God in different modes, that is the heresy of modalism. 
and Bullivant goes on to explain these in a little more detail and we're going to look at those now. So let's start with tritheism, really straightforward, the idea that there are three distinct separate gods. So there's not one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate gods. And actually this heresy didn't come about through Christianity, but it came from outside the church. So from other religions such as Islam and um, Judaism, who've accused Christians of believing in three gods. So to clarify beliefs about the Trinity, the Christian councils, Nicaea, Chalcedon, um, Toledo, etc., all places where um, Christians met to formalise teaching, they said that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit refer to three persons in one nature. So if we're using the, if we're using the Latin, personae is the Latin for person and substantia is the Latin for nature. In Greek, Hypostasis is the word for person, and ousia, as we've, as we've encountered already, is the word for nature. Generally, because the New Testament is written in Greek, I'm going to refer to ousia throughout this, and hypostasis. So, Gregory of uh, Nazianus uh, expresses one nature, three person, in terms of gold. And he says, you know, when we speak of gold, even if it's changed into many different things, still it is and is mentioned as one and Bullivant adapts this um, this explanation he says think of a gold ring think of a gold coin think of a gold cru crucifix we don't say there are many golds what we say is it's one gold in three expressions gold ring gold coin gold crucifix made up of gold they're all the same substance, but they are different forms of the same substance. There's one gold, which has a single substance, a single nature, a single ousia. The coin, the ring, the crucifix is each gold. They fully share the same ousia. They are made up fully of gold. But the coin, the ring and the crucifix are not the same. They've got different personae, if we're using the Latin, hypostases, if we are using the, um, the Greek. But they have the same substance, ousia, if we're using the Greek, substantia, if we're using the Latin. If we look at Arianism, denial of the second belief that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is each God. And what Arianism does, it elevates one part of the Trinity above the other parts. It's saying one is more important than the other. And Arius was a very popular church leader in the second and third centuries. And he believed that the Son could not really be God. He was happy to call Jesus God by virtue of the fact that God had confirmed authority on the Son. But really, for Arius, the Son was subordinate to the Father since he was in some sense created. And Arius maintained that the father had a different substance, ousia, substantia, ousia, than the sons, so that they were not made of the same thing. And Bullivant states, um, he uses the analogy of uh, Pinocchio and Geppetto to explain this concept. Um, he says, Arius's view of God is like Geppetto and Jesus is like Pinocchio. Pinocchio's not really a part of Geppetto, he's been created by Geppetto. He's wooden, he doesn't have the same oozier, substantia, substance as Geppetto. And even though Pinocchio does eventually become flesh and blood, he is still the creation of Geppetto. And that's Bullivant's understanding and explanation, analogously, of Arianism. And Arianism ultimately failed. The Emperor Constantine, when he called the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, uh, he called it because he didn't want his empire to suffer from theological division. Constantine had adopted Christianity as the state religion of Rome. And the Council of Nicaea rejected the views of Arius, making it very clear that, quote, Jesus was begotten from the Father. And that's to say, from the same substance, the same oozier of the Father. And from the creed, God from God, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made. And then this word consubstantial, homoousios, with the same substance with the Father. So anything less than Jesus being the same substance of God would mean that God didn't fully participate in human life and therefore couldn't fully save humanity. And that's absolutely key to Christianity. The idea that God gave of himself to suffer and die for us, that ultimate act of love. He gave his only son who was God. And this idea, Arianism, goes against that and sort of implies that humanity have not been fully saved as the son is not fully God. Hence the reason why it's a heresy. We move then on to modalism, which is um, the idea where you deny the third belief that the Father and the Son are not the same. So modalists believe that the Trinity are just modes of being. They're like masks that an actor might wear. Still the same actor, but there are different masks. So Bullivant uses the example of um, the uh, comedian Sasha Bar Baron Cohen. Who, has the, who plays the roles of Ali G, Borat and the Dictator. These are the three modes for Bullivant of Sasha Baron Cohen. So modalism, what it's trying to do is maintain monotheism. It's trying to avoid slipping into tritheism. But by doing so, what it's actually doing is denying the reality of the persons of the Trinity. It's saying the three persons are really just masks over the one God. That is modalism for the problem with this view is that it denies the differences between the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, essentially saying they're all the same. It's just a mask. For example, this is why modalism doesn't work. It would seem ridiculous to suggest it was the Father that was crucified or the Son that descends on the disciples at Pentecost. It doesn't seem to make sense. So Christians believed against modalism that there must be some kind of plurality within the life of God, more than just modes. It's a, it's a difference, it's not just a mask. So that's why Tertullian comes up with this idea of the Trinity. So the first person to use the word, he combined the Latin word trias, meaning three, and unitas, meaning unity, to make trinitas, trinity. So the first person to talk about it, trinity. Uh, Tertullian and the word Trinity and he's combating all those various um, heresies. So that's our brief description of the Trinity and now we move on to the filioque controversy and this was one of the greatest rows in the history of Christianity and it's centered on a single word filioque and filioque is linked to the doctrine of the Trinity. So in order to understand the filioque controversy, you have to fully understand the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity in and of itself. And the filioque row actually contributed to the split of the Eastern Church, which mostly became the Orthodox Church, and the Western Church, which mostly became the Roman Catholic Church, and obviously it's later Protestant offshoots. I mean, there were other matters as well, but the row of the, over the filioque clause led to the great schism. The word schism means split of 1054, where the, two, the, the one Christian church split basically between East and West. One with a capital in Rome in the West, one with a capital in Constantinople, which is now known as Istanbul in the East. And you can look at my introductory um, PowerPoint on, uh, on that for a little more detail if you so wish. So let's look at the filioque controversy. Before we do that, we've just got to understand one more word. When I use the word Godhead, what we're talking about is the divine substance, the oozier of the Christian God. That's what we mean by what, what God is. And the word filioque in Lat Latin literally translated, get your teeth in sprinkle, literally translated means and from the sun. So that one word filioque means and from the sun, if you translate it to English. So what was this controversy? Well, it has to do with the debate in the church about the relationship of the Holy Spirit to God. And this is the idea or the question is, does the Holy Spirit proceed or emanate from the Father 
as stated in the Nicene Creed? Or does the Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son? Many theologians in the East, today's Orthodox Church, believe that the Father alone is the cause and source of divinity. In other words, there's only one source of divinity in the Godhead. So um, the Holy Spirit only comes from the Father. That is the source of the Holy Spirit. The Son only comes from the Father. That is the source. Other theologians believe that could easily lead people to thinking of the Father as having two sons. And what they were trying to do was introduce the phrase filioque and from the Son into the creed to avoid that confusion or that heresy, for want of a better word. So let's look at how the Christian creed progressed. So in the Council of Nicaea, in 325 CE, there was just a statement about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, that just said, we believe in the Holy Ghost. Just a, 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 a key statement. Now, in the Council of Constantinople in 381 CE, so roughly 55 years afterwards, 56 years afterwards, they changed the wording to be, we believe in the Holy Ghost and then they added the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. And all the churches were present and all the churches agreed to that wording. So we have in the Nicene Creed, the key statement of Christian belief. We believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. Then we go to the Council of Toledo roughly 200 years later and they adapted the Nicene Creed a little further and so we now have we believe in the Holy Ghost the Lord the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and then they added one word filioque and the Son so the word was added by the Western Latin churches and it was done without the agreement of the heads of the Eastern Greek churches. Remember, all churches had already agreed 200 years earlier to the wording of proceeds from the Father. The Eastern churches had not agreed to the insertion of one word, filioque, which changed a sort of a key belief about where the Holy Spirit comes from, hence the row. So why did the Western Church add that word? And really, they were influenced by a number of key Christian thinkers, people like Hilary of Poitiers, Augustine of Hippo, Cyril of Alexander. The main antagonist was actually Augustine. Okay? So these theologians, and in particular Augustine, wanted to try and understand the Trinity in terms of relationships in the Godhead, in the Usia. So rather than think in terms of a single source of divinity, Augustine thought in terms of mutual relationships and believed that there is a bond of love between the Father and the Son, and that bond is the Holy Spirit. So Augustine, therefore, comes down strongly in favour of the spirit processing, proceeding, coming from both the Father and the Son. So if we look at this idea, the Eastern Church is saying the Son and the Holy Spirit come from the Father. They share the oozia, they're the same oozia of the Father, but they come from that. The Latin Church accepts that, but there's this little extra arrow. This is the filioque bit. Not only does the Holy Spirit come from the Father, but it also, also comes from the Son. And that's the bond of love between Father and Son. So, if we look at the Orthodox Church, that's where we're looking. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then if we look at the Catholic Church, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is proceeding from the two. Whereas in the Orthodox Church, the Holy Spirit is just proceeding from the Father. Hopefully that makes sense. 
So Augustine was very influential. The Western churches accepted his argument that human beings can know the Trinity from their own experience because there are traces of the Trinity in the human soul. Now, th now think about this, okay? Um, you are getting some sort of knowledge of God. And what we're talking about here is um, the um, aspect of the Trinity. And I've, for some reason, I've forgotten the word because I'm being really thick and I'll get there in the end. Uh, the aspect of the economic Trinity, what God does. And by experience the economic Trinity, you can understand the imminent Trinity. Now, the issue with this is Augustine isn't differentiating between the between the two. For him, it's all one thing. OK, so because the Holy Spirit acts within the Trinity as a bond of love between the Father and the Son, it follows for Augustine that the Holy Spirit must proceed from both. It must come from both. Since the Holy Spirit acts within humans, uniting them with the Father and the Son in a bond of love, it also follows that humans can derive the nature of God from this experience. In a sense, access the imminent God, get some understanding of what essentially is the um, epistemic distance transcendent God. Eastern Church is not so happy with that idea. So let's go back to our definitions. Imminent Trinity is what God is. Economic Trinity, what God does. Now, you may get an insight into what, you know, a, the slight clues to the nature of God from the actions of the Holy Spirit, the actions of the Son, perhaps the actions of the, of the Father. But you are never, for some Christians, particularly the Eastern Orthodox Church, going to really understand the Father at all because he is at, is at that epistemic distance. So they consider Augustine's argument to be unacceptable because you can't base your doctrine of the Trinity on your own experience. That is, um, human experience is always going to fail there. The imminent Trinity, three persons, one God, what God is, is being confused for the Eastern Church with the actions. The Western Church isn't making those distinctions between economic and imminent. So the Eastern Church accepts the structure of the Trinity, three equal persons, but doesn't accept that anything is revealed to us of the inner nature of God through the Trinity, other than the Father alone is the source of the divinity, the Son alone is begotten of the Father, and that the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. That is all you can know. And the dispute raged for six centuries, but it didn't divide the church until, well, um, a good 500 years later, when Pope Benedict VIII agreed to use the word for the first time at a mass in Rome in 1014. And then 40 years later, the Roman church accused the Eastern churches of heresy for not accepting filioque. And this, coupled with many other issues, largely based on misunderstandings between the Greek and Latin traditions and obviously the East opposition to the Pope making any change to the Nicene Creed without the agreement of an ecumenical council that led to the Great Schism of 1054 CE. And just in case you're not sure what the word ecumenical means, it just means representing a number of different churches. So it was all down to that unilateral decision by the Western churches in 500 odd CE adding that word filioque, it rumbled on for 500 odd more years. Eventually the Pope uses it in a mass and the split happens, all for a disagreement between economic and imminent trinity. And it remains a major theological difference between East and the West to this day. So that leads us on to our final part which is modern developments of the Trinity. And here we are looking at the work of Karl Barth. 
So he was a Protestant Swiss theologian. His most famous work was the 13 volume um, Church Dogmatics. And in it, he talks a bit about the Trinity. And Barth believes we can know God only because God has revealed himself to us. So the only reason of knowing, the only way we can know God is if God chooses to reveal himself to us. And he has to do that in ways that we can see and we can understand. And he believes that's with the help of the Holy Spirit. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can know nothing about God. And for Bart, this knowledge is given to us in two movements. So it's given to us in the Son as an objective unveiling of what God is. And it's given to us in the Spirit as a subjective reception or imparting of God working for us. And he uses an analogy to explain this. Okay. And he uses the analogy of two men witnessing Jesus's crucifixion. So imagine there's Jesus nailed up on the cross and two people are watching it. The first man says, there's a common criminal being executed. And that's because the first man has not recognized the unveiling of God in Jesus. For him, it is no more than a common criminal being crucified. The second man says, there's the son of God dying for me. Now to that man, the Holy Spirit has imparted the recognition of God in Jesus. So for Bart, no Holy Spirit, no understanding of God. So Bart concludes that we're incapable of responding to the objective revelation of God in Jesus unless recognition of that revelation is given by the Holy Spirit. We cannot understand anything about God unless the Holy Spirit allows us to have that understanding. But also doesn't like the use of the word person, which for him implies distinct personalities and the risk of falling into tritheism. Remember that heresy, the belief in three distinct gods. And he uses the German word Seinsweiser, which is just mode or a, way, uh, or a way of being to avoid this confusion. Now, part of the problem of this is because he uses the word mode, albeit the German word Seinsweiser, he then gets accused by some uh, such as Maltman of modalism, another heresy. But is it modalism? We'll look at that a little later. So for Bart, God has three ways or modes of being. Every work that the Trinity does in relation to us is a work of the whole Trinity, but, so the whole oozier of the Trinity, but it's more appropriately carried out by God in one of the three modes. So for instance, the incarnation, although it's the work of the entire Trinity, it obviously properly belongs to the Son to be incarnated and not to the Father or to the Spirit. And Barth argues this is not modalism. Remember the her heresy that God's a single person who throughout uh, history has revealed himself in three different modes. Think of Ali G, Borat, the dictator, the mask of an actor. For Barth, there are real distinctions within God. The different mutual relationships between the persons within the Trinity each mode is different from the others because of their different internal relationships. So let's look at these three modes in a little more detail. Let's start with Bart's view of the Father. So Bart says, who God is towards us, our understanding of God, well, first of all, is in himself. Bart says, the Father is the Father, not because we call him so, or because that is what he is for us, but because this is what God really is in himself. That is who he is, his oozier. God is a father because he's capable of relating to that which is distinct from himself, i.e. he relates to the son as distinct from him and whom he begets. He, he gives, not saying good lies to, but creates he relates to the spirit as distinct from him in that it proceeds from him. 
So it's because of what God is in himself that he is the way he is for us. So we've got the imminent part of the Trinity, what God is in himself, and the way he is for us, which is the economic part of the Trinity. When we look at the Son, Bart shows that Jesus is distinct. He's the one who most appropriately takes human nature to himself as a son of man in human history. And he uses the word logos and sarkos, word of God made flesh. But Bart also emphasizes how Jesus is one with the Father. He's not separate from him. When he speaks of God, of Jesus as the eternal decision of God, the decision that included all God had planned to create. God's decision is identical with a person of God himself, Jesus, as the pre-existing word or decision of God, is also the Logos Asarkos, word without flesh. So seeing Jesus in this way emphasizes Jesus' unity with God rather than his difference from God. So if I was doing Bart in an essay, I would make really sure I understood his concept of Logos and Sarkos, word of God made flesh, and Logos Asarkos, word without flesh, to understand the difference and perhaps combat the idea of modalism. When we take the Holy Spirit, Karl Barth says, the Spirit belongs to the Spirit mode of God, and it's a witness to the Father's work in Jesus, and it reveals who Jesus is to us. Remember the analogy of the two people looking at the cross. The Spirit's relation to the Father is that it proceeds from the Father, but it's also the Spirit of Christ and reveals who Christ is to us. So Barth thinks of the Spirit as the Spirit of both and sent by both. So therefore, he would agree with Filioque, the, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and also from the Son. So guess what? The Eastern Church doesn't like Bart very much. So by the Father's grace or favour, the Spirit helps us to understand and relate to God. The Spirit enables our subjective reception of what God has done, an understanding, albeit subjective, of what God is. Without the Spirit, Jesus' death on the cross would not be recognised by us as any more than the death of a criminal. Think back to that analogy. Bart also has this concept of God in threefold repetition. He wants to emphasise that God doesn't exist in successive episodes, you know, where you get the Father coming first, who then generates the Son, who's manifest in the Incarnation, then when he goes up to heaven, then we get the Spirit. So we've got this sort of three fold repetition that is not what Bart is after and he's trying to avoid that okay but rather the idea that God is all present to himself as three in oneness in a timeless eternal way he calls this God in threefold repetition to emphasize this eternal aspect of always continuing repeating three parts so for Bart God's action always has three forms, three parts to it. God is the revealer, and what he reveals, his revelation, together with the effect that it has on the world, his revealedness, shows us what God is. God is a revealer, revelation, and revealedness, or Father, Son, and Spirit. God reveals himself, he reveals himself through himself, he reveals himself, Father, Spirit, Son. The Son, as the revelation of the Father, is the visible, historical manifestation of the mystery of God, this epistemic God. The, the objective unveiling of who God is, and the Spirit reveals him to us enabling us to recognize that Jesus wasn't just a common criminal dying on the cross. It gives us that subjective recognition of what God has done, all being imperfect because it's subjective, but we can get an understanding. Both are needed. The objective revelation of the Son can't be understood without the subjective recognition for Bart. So 
just to finish off the PowerPoint, let's evaluate. And what I've done is put some challenges and then counter challenges, one argument and then a counter argument, one after the other, so you can get a feel if you're going to evaluate in an essay how you might uh, do this for BART. So the first challenge you might have is that the Eastern Orthodox Church rejects as invalid any attempt to revive who God is, uh, who God is from the economic trinity. Extra God there, I don't know why I've done that. Ironic for a PowerPoint on the Trinity. Uh, so we're trying to derive who God is from, so the Eastern Orthodox Church says you can't derive who God is, knowledge from God from the economic trinity. God, God is a mystery not known by man. It also rejects filioque and so therefore rejects Bart because for Bart, the spirit is the spirit of Christ, reveals Christ to us. So the spirit does also come from him. However, if you want to counteract that, you could argue that the Western Church has for centuries accepted the merging of the imminent and economic trinities and the filioque clause. So there you go, counter argument. Maltman thinks that Bart commits the heresy of modalism in seeing God as modes rather than as persons. However, you could counteract by saying Bart does see real distinction between the modes in terms of their different relationships. He emphasises certain operations of the Trinity more properly belong to one of the three persons rather than the others, i.e. it's uh, more properly said of the Spirit that he acts as a witness and revealer, and more properly said of the Son that he takes on flesh. He meant his term science to emphasise God's unity and so avoid tritheism, and perhaps you could argue it was just a badly chosen term. Also, um, you could perhaps argue that Bart doesn't distinguish between the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. However, um, you could then say, well, he does because you've got that Greek term logos or sarkos for the Son and then logos and sarkos, meaning word without flesh. Um, God, the Son and the Godhead distinct from the Father. So Bart is making a distinction between Son of God and Son of Man, the former referring to the eternal word, the latter referring to Jesus incarnated. But then distinguishes between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit obviously bears witness to the Son. Now the criticism, you could say that Bart sees the Father, Son and Holy Spirit as one God in eternal repetition, which implies that they exist one after the other, not at the same time. This destroys the eternal unity of the Godhead. However, whilst Bart does see God in threefold repetition, he insists he is one God in each repetition. He's trying to highlight the unchanging nature of the one eternal trinity. God is unimpaired unity, but also unimpaired distinction. Revealer, Father, Revelation, Son, Revealedness, Spirit. Hopefully that makes sense.